One of the reasons I love living in Edinburgh is how varied the city is. It has so much to offer. If you fancy going for a hill walk, you can do so in the centre of town and head to Arthur's Seat. If you want some history, it's all around you. If you want some peace and quiet, there are numerous parks and green spaces dotted around. And if you want the sea, the city lies on the shores of the Firth of Forth. The Firth of Forth is an estuary that meets the North Sea, with Firth being a cognate of the Norse word fjord, and Forth being the name of the river that forms the estuary. On the northern shore of the Firth of Forth sits the Kingdom of Fife. Fife was once the ancient royal capital of Scotland. Kings were born, crowned and buried here, and the seat of power and royal residence wasn't Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh, it was Dunfermline Palace. The coastline of Fife is a stunning mix of sandy beaches, rocky outcrops and ruined castles, with one of these ruins being St Andrew's Castle. St Andrews is perhaps best known these days as being the home of golf and for the university where the odd prince and princess have studied. But its history goes back far beyond these more modern claims to fame. The borough, named after the Apostle St Andrew, was once the ecclesiastical capital of the country, with the now ruined cathedral being the most important site in medieval times for the Catholic Church in Scotland, and thus it was the most important centre of pilgrimage in Scotland. With all that history, you won't be surprised at all to learn that it's home to lots and lots of ghosts. Construction on St Andrew's Cathedral began back in 1158, and when finished, it was the largest church to have been built in Scotland. The cathedral fell into ruin after the Reformation in the 16th century, when the dominant Roman Catholic Church was replaced by the predominantly Calvinist National Kirk. Within the cathedral grounds stands an older building, St Rule's Tower, which formed part of an even older church. The tower is thought to be around 100 years older than the ruined cathedral and stands 100 feet high. St Rule's also has a reputation for being haunted. For several hundred years, a mysterious figure has haunted the ruins of St Rule's. An apparition has been seen walking up and down the tower steps and, on occasion, the spirit is witnessed looking out the tower windows. The mysterious figure witnessed is said to have been the spirit of Robert de Montrose, a 12th century prior. In life he was thought to have been a pleasant and just man, but wasn't afraid to punish any monk who broke their vows. One monk, who'd been disciplined by de Montrose, didn't care for his kindly reputation and threw Robert out one of the windows of the tower. As in life, Robert's spirit is said to be kind and caring. His presence is believed to be a good omen, and anyone who's seen him while on the stairs is said to be guaranteed safe passage up and down the stairs. In the 1950s, a visitor to the ruins found his path up the stairs blocked by a man dressed in a monk's habit. The monk turned to the visitor and asked if he required any help climbing the steep stairs. Feeling confident, our visitor declined the kind offer and moved to squeeze past the monk. The inside of the staircase is narrow and not wide enough to let two people pass easily, so our visitor expected to feel the monk brush against him as he pushed past, but he felt nothing. And upon turning round, he found the narrow stairs now empty. To the west of the cathedral lies St Leonard's Kirk. First mentioned in 1413, the kirk may have been built on the site of an older 12th century structure, built by Augustinian monks. The spirit, believed to haunt the location, is not that of a monk, but that of a veiled nun, who has a horrifying and heartbreaking origin, and terrifies those unlucky enough to see her. The following is an extract from the 1921 book St Andrew's Ghosts by William Thomas Linskill. In the time of charming Mary Stuart, our White Queen, there lived in the Old South Street a very lovely lady belonging to a very old Scottish family, and her beauty and wit brought many admirers to claim her hand, but with little or no success, she waved them all away. At last she became a fiance to a fine and brave young fellow who came from the East Lothian country, and for some months all went merrily as a marriage bell. 
but at last clouds overspread the rosy horizon. She resolved that she would never become an earthly bride, but would take the veil and become a bride of the Holy Church, a nun in point of fact. When her lover heard that she had left home and entered the house of Holy Sisters, he at once announced his intention of hastening to St Andrews, seizing her and marrying her at once. In this project, it would seem the young lady's parents were in perfect agreement with the devoted youth. He did hasten to St Andrews almost immediately, and there received a terrible shock. On meeting this once lovely and loved maiden, he discovered that she had actually done what she would written and threatened to do. Sooner than be an earthly bride, she had mutilated her face by slitting her nostrils, she had cut off her eyelids, both her top and bottom lips, and had branded her fair cheeks with cruel, hot irons. The poor youth, on seeing her famous beauty thus destroyed, fled to Edinburgh where he committed suicide, and she, after becoming a nun, died from grief and remorse. That all happened nearly 400 years ago, but her spirit with the terribly marred and mutilated face still wanders all the nights in the peaceful little avenue to the old St Leonard's Iron Kirk Gate down the Penge Road. She's all dressed in black, with a long black veil over the once lovely face, and carries a lantern in her hand. Should any bold visitor to that avenue meet her, she slowly sweeps her face veil aside, raises the lantern to her scarred face, and discloses those awful features to their horrified gaze. Linskill then went on to write of an incident where a young man named Talbot had encountered this phantom. Talbot had been walking late one evening near the Penge Road that runs down the side of the cathedral and had been found by his friend named Wilson in a terrible state. Wilson recounts to Linskill how he found Talbot leaning against a tree along the avenue to St Leonard's Kirk. He went up to him and when Talbot turned a horrified face towards him, saying, Oh my God, have you come to me again? and fell down in a fit or a swoon. He got some passers-by to take poor Talbot to his rooms. Then he came round for me. We sat up with him in wonder and amazement. And briefly, this is what he told us. After walking up and down the Penge Road, he thought he would take a survey of the little avenue, when at the end he saw a light approaching him, and he turned back to meet it. Thinking it was a policeman, he wished him good evening, but got no reply. On approaching nearer, he saw it to be a veiled female with a lantern. Getting quite close, she stopped in front of him, threw aside her long veil, and held up the lantern towards him. My God, said Talbot, I can never forget or describe that terrible, fearful face. I felt choked. I fell like a log at her feet. I remember no more till I find myself in these rooms. Belief in the nun's apparition continues to this day. People who are local to the area believe that if you see the nun walking towards you, you should turn on the spot three times and run in the opposite direction. The 16th century was a turbulent time in Scotland, with religious reform sweeping the country. St Andrews was not immune from this turmoil, and one incident left an indelible stain on the very stonework of the town. 24-year-old Patrick Hamilton was an educated and very well-travelled young man. Born in Glasgow in 1520, he travelled to Europe and spent some time studying at the University of Paris, where he first learned of the teachings of Martin Luther. He then spent some time in Belgium before returning to Scotland and settling on St Andrews as a place to live, study and also teach. Patrick was a keen reformer and in February of 1528 he fell foul of James Beaton, the Archbishop of St Andrews. Fearing the impact of Patrick's teachings, he was swiftly put on trial, found guilty and sentenced to death, to be burnt at the stake to be precise. His accusers wasted no time in carrying out the sentence, and he was burned on the same day. But it didn't go to plan. It was a cold, damp February day, 
His executioners struggled to keep the fires burning. Again and again the flames went out. As Patrick's torture continued, their desperation grew, and it's rumoured that they even tried stuffing gunpowder under his arms. While they were able to ignite that, it didn't have the desired effect and merely added more injury to an already horrifically injured Patrick. Eventually the fire took and Patrick burned, It said until 6pm. But this may not have been the end of Patrick. It's believed that Patrick's torment is burned into the brickwork on St Salvatore's Chapel, where the execution took place. If you look up, you can see a brick with what looks like a face looking back down at you. People testified that that was Patrick's face. But Patrick's story doesn't end there. The site of the execution is marked with a monogram of Patrick's initials set into the cobblestones, and there is a belief that if a student of the university walks over the cobbles, they'll be cursed to fail their exams. The sound of crackling and the smell of burning flesh near Hamilton's execution site has also been witnessed. Over the years, there have been multiple reported sightings of a phantom coach charging along the road to Strathkinnis, with perhaps the most famous encounter happening in the early part of the 20th century to a man named Willie Carson. It was a hot, dark and stormy night, not wet. Fitful black clouds floated now and again at a rapid pace over the moon, which now and then shone out brightly. In the distance, the sea made a perpetual moan, And, at intervals, the dark eastern sky was lit up by flashes of summer wildfire lightning over the distant cathedral towers. Now and again, I could hear the mutter of faraway thunder, and there were incessant gusts of wind. I must have been about two miles along the road when I could discern some very large object approaching me rapidly. As it came nearer, I noticed it resembled a coach, dark, heavy, primitive. It seemed to have four large black horses, and the driver was a muffled, shapeless figure. It approached with a low humming or buzzing sound, which was most peculiar and most unpleasant to hear. The horses made a hollow kind of ticking sound with their feet. Otherwise it was noiseless. No earthly coach of the kind could go without any ordinary sound. It was weird and eerie in the extreme. As it passed me, the moon shone out brightly, and I saw for a second a ghastly white face at the coach window. But I saw these four strange, silent black horses, the more extraordinary tall, swaddled-up, shapeless driver, and the quaint, black, gloomy old coach, with a coffin-shaped box on the roof, only far, far too well. One most remarkable thing was that it threw no shadow of any kind. Just as it passed me, there was a terrific roar of thunder and a blaze of lightning that nearly blinded me. And in the distance, I saw that horrible, ghastly, receding coach. Then clouds came over the moon, and all was black. A darkness one could feel. A darkness of a shut-up, smothering vault. I felt sick and dazed for a minute or two. I couldn't make out if I'd been struck by the lightning or was paralysed. There's also a tale of two tramps who were making their way to St Andrews along the Strathkinnis Road late one evening. The night was stormy and there was not much in the way of shelter for our poor unfortunates. A large coach approached both men from seemingly out of nowhere, stopping beside them. The door opened and a white hand beckoned the men forth but only one entered, and as soon as he did, the door slammed shut and the coach sped off. The man's body was said to have been found some time later, on the East Sands Beach. Our final story takes place within the cathedral. For over 200 years, a woman has been seen roaming the passageways of the ruined cathedral. The woman, dressed in white, including white gloves, has been described as being very bonny, with long, dark, flowing hair, beautiful features and possessing brilliant eyes. 
It's believed this woman in white is the spirit of one of Mary Queen of Scots' maids of honour, known as Marie's, who'd fallen deeply in love with a French minstrel called Castellar. Charming and handsome, Castellar had no interest in his love-stricken admirer. His attention was firmly fixed on his mistress, Mary. It's not known exactly how events unfolded, but it's believed Castellar's behaviour went too far, and his words or actions caused scandal in 16th century St Andrews, and our young musician was sentenced to be beheaded. Before his execution, Mary had sent our young Marie to plead with Castellar, begging him to leave Scotland in exchange for a pardon and a chance at life. Without hesitation, the love-struck musician declined the Queen's offer, preferring death to life without her. Heartbroken, the Marie relayed the message to her mistress and spent the night fretting about the fate of the minstrel, pacing up and down in her quarters, hoping for a miracle. The miracle never came though, and the next morning, Castellar was gone. Unable to stand it, she left the Queen's service and decided to live out her final days as a nun. After her death, her apparition began to be seen wandering around the grounds of the cathedral, particularly near Kirk Hill. Witnesses describe a beautiful, dark-haired woman gliding past them, sometimes turning to look back at them with an enchanting yet sad smile. Often she vanishes near St. Rule's Tower next to the cathedral. On occasion, her spirit has been witnessed looking out one of the windows in St. Rule's, sometimes waving a handkerchief. In 1868, stone masonry work which was being carried out in the tower stumbled upon some stone coffins, buried within a hidden chamber. In one coffin lay the remains of a young woman, with long dark hair, wearing a white dress and gloves. Could this have been the remains of the Lady in White? That's something we will never know the answer to. But we do now know why the Victorians called St. Rules the Chamber of Corpses. <laughs>